So this morning we are beginning our, our new Advent series, uh, which is titled uh, Various Hope. This is going to be our, our focus over the next uh, four weeks. So we have reached Advent already, as we know. Uh, the tree is up. Jumper's not quite on yet, <laughs> but possibly next week. Uh, if you have your Bibles, let's just take a moment to, to focus on John chapter 1 and, and verses 1 to 18. So John 1, 1 to 18. The words are going to be up on the screen. I'm reading from the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible. So John says this, as we think about the significance of the incarnation, Jesus coming to earth as God and as man to meet with us. John says in verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was created through him, and yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of natural descent, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him and exclaimed, This was the one of whom I said, The one coming after me ranks ahead of me, because he existed before me. Indeed, we have all received grace upon grace from his fullness. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The one and only Son who is himself God and is at the Father's side, he has revealed him. Amen. May God bless, bless the reading of his word uh, today. Let's just take a moment to, to ask that God would speak to us as we focus on this passage. So Father, we, we recognise that you are God and we are not and, and we come with open hearts and open minds. We pray that by your Spirit you would minister to us, that we would be changed and transformed by what your word says. Grant us freedom to hear what it is you have to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, as we move into this Advent season, uh, we want to recognise this morning that Advent is perhaps a word that you have heard, uh, but never really come to terms with in terms of its precise meaning. Uh, perhaps there's every chance this morning you have come to terms with and you have understood what Advent means and what it is. But because it's been a full year, you've forgotten what this word means and why this is theologically and spiritually significant for you and for me as this year 2022 comes to an end. Uh, Advent is a four-week uh, celebration practiced by Christians of all denominations. And it's a celebration in anticipation of Christmas. And all that this celebration means for us who are followers of Christ to help us understand better why Advent is important, the word itself simply means arrival, arrival or beginning. So arrival or beginning. Through this time of Advent, we're not just celebrating the arrival of Jesus within our own lives. So his incarnation, his life, his death and his resurrection for us. No, Advent is also this shared experience together. Advent ought to be something that we do collectively as a family. Because Jesus came not just to bring us back to himself. Jesus came to make us one. He came to make us one family together as we recognise all that Christ is to us. And I want just to, to encourage us as a church family, even as we think about this devotional and as we use that together as a family, as we enter into this time of year, do not be shy. Do not be shy in encouraging one another, sharing verses with each other, Highlighting something of a meaning of Advent together eh, as a church family. It's just so important that we do that. There's such an emphasis on the individual at Christmas. And yet we have this tremendous opportunity to be different. To stand out and to recognise the importance of being together 
and using this Christmas celebration as a means of us coming to a deeper relationship with Christ. So the significance for you and for me during this Christmas season will only ever become heart knowledge for us when we journey into this celebration with community, with us together. Advent only ever makes sense together as we see how good God has been to us through his son Jesus. So we see this together. This is when it makes sense for us. Not when we try and do this by ourselves. Uh, Advent is not just a celebration of what God has done. The God who came to earth uh, as a man. Advent is also a celebration of what God is going to one day do. Of what God has planned for us uh, in eternity. So we're looking backwards, but we're also looking forwards with great excitement. I hope we're excited about all that God has planned for us. I just see deadpan faces through it. So we are rejoicing at the fact that God sent his one and only son into the world. We're rejoicing at the fact that because of this, we are new creations. We're transformed. And we're also rejoicing at this incredible reality that Jesus will one day make all things new. All evil, all sin, and all death will be defeated. Amen? Amen. And we will be in perfect communion with our Creator, our Lord and Saviour, if we have faith in Him. Some Christian traditions uh, practice Advent and and they they focus on, on four topics or themes that are attached to Advent. Peace, love, joy and hope. Peace, love, joy and hope. And within each week of Advent, there's a different theme uh, or focus as a means of us coming to a fuller understanding of what this, cel- what this celebration means for each one of us. And this morning, and for this, this Advent season at Denison Baptist, we're going to do something slightly different to that. We're going to focus on one of these topics, hope. Hope, all of which would make sense for us this morning in light of the fact that our sermon series is titled, There is Hope. There is hope. So over the next four weeks, as we take time to look at the Gospels together, we're going to think about how there is hope from the messiness. There is hope from the messi- the messiness. What it is we're going to think about uh, next week. The week following on from that, we're going to think about how there is hope through the promise. How it is that God has promised to his people that he will one day come and renew all things. And in our final Sunday of Advent, we're going to take time to reflect on how there is hope for the hopeless. There is hope for the hopeless. We're going to think about some examples of scripture to understand the life-giving hope for those who could see no way forward. And often that can be our lives as well. We can feel hopeless. We can see no way forward. And yet Jesus offers us hope. He offers us hope in all that we face. So this morning we're going to take time to think about how there is hope in the darkness. There is hope in the darkness. The reality is, as we think about these different themes and focuses, there is hope in all of these areas because Jesus has come, past tense. Jesus is with us. He is with us. And Jesus will one day return in all of his glory in order to make all things new. He has come, he is with us, and he will one day return. And there is nothing more hopeful than the fact that all of the wrong, all of the brokenness, All of the sinfulness that we see in our world and in our lives will one day be made right because of the saving and transforming work of Christ. That's a Christmas message that that we can all take hold of this morning and over the next month or so. How easy it is for us, let's be honest, how easy it is for us just to get caught up within our society and to focus on all of the things that our society says Christmas is all about and yet how important it is for you and for me to take hold of this time to feed off of God's word to ask that God would fill us by his Holy Spirit to be intentional about how it is we use this time of year all as a means of living out the great command to love God with all that we are and all of this as a means of living out the great commission to then go and make disciples of all nations so big picture for us this morning through this season Advent, we understand Advent as arrival or beginning. And this means the arrival of Jesus, the beginning of new life for you and for me as we choose to run to him. 
And within this subject of Advent, our focus will be on this theme of hope. Hope. So Denison Baptist Church, as we begin this series, let me encourage you, there is hope. There is hope. And his name is Jesus. And without question, hope is fundamental. It is fundamental to human life and flourishing. To have hope is to long to see something better than what currently is. In many ways, that's a really helpful definition of hope. Hope is therefore not exclusively Christian. It's a part of who we are as human beings. Our world has some, although a significantly different, and perhaps you might even say a diluted version of hope. These hopes that our world carries, these hopes that we so often carry, are often on this broad spectrum from mundane and trivial to serious and significant. We hope that our society gets better. We hope that we stay in good health. We hope that we become better versions of ourselves. That's one end of the spectrum. But we also hope that we get a parking space. We hope our football team wins. We hope we get a potato scone with our fry up. What we often mean when our society and often when we ourselves speak about hope is simply this, optimism, optimism. I think based on my own assessment, it's all going to work out. That's optimism. Or my desire is, based on my own assessment, that it would all work out. None of that is necessarily bad. In fact, hope in so many of its forms is a gift that God has given to each one of us. At the end of the film, The Shawshank Redemption, the character Andy writes a letter to Red. They've both managed to get out of prison. And he writes, remember Red, hope is a good thing. Maybe the best of things, and no good thing ever dies. Now, there's much to commend from this quote. In fact, there's much to commend from this film. I would recommend you watch it, although it is difficult to watch at different points. The film and the book by Stephen King, they go far in unpacking this idea of hope. But I would argue, like so much of the hope that we see in our world, it doesn't go far enough. So it, it does go far in helping us to understand what hope is, but it doesn't go far enough doesn't go far enough because there's so much more to hope than the circumstances that we find ourselves in. This is evident in our lives. It's undeniably evident from the pages of scripture. True hope is not essentially a positive outlook on what might come to pass. True hope is when you can stare into the abyss of reality. You can look at all of the sin and all of the brokenness that we find ourselves in the middle of and you can still say God is enough God is enough this kind of hope recognises that God will have the last word on all of us and God will have the last word on our lives God really will see us through so when you take time to study and unpack hope in the Bible what you see is that hope is less about the physical things of this world and it's more about a person and again, as I've said already, his name is Jesus. Jesus. So paying attention, that's good. <laughs> uh, when we take time to look at, when we take time to reflect on all that he is and all that he has done, we can say with absolute confidence this morning, there is hope. When we focus on Jesus, in spite of what we see in our world, in spite of this abyss that's before us, we can say there is hope because of him. So Psalm 130, verses 5 to 7, the psalmist speaks of hope. And in these verses, he uses two words for hope, kava and yakal. Kava and yakal. The word kava is a word that Hebrews would use for putting tension on a cord until there's release. In other words, it's a word that's used for waiting until there's this desired outcome. And the other word for hope, yakal, simply means in a more general sense to wait for something. So in Psalm 130 and verses 5 to 7, what real and authentic hope is, the psalmist expresses his hope in different ways within these few verses as a means of conveying his trust in Yahweh. So the psalmist wants to express hope in various ways as a wholehearted focus on the person of Yahweh. So the psalmist says this, I wait or I kava, I kava for the Lord, I wait and put my hope, again, that same word, my kava in his word. 
I wait again, I kava for the Lord, more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. Israel, put your hope, your yakal, it's a different word he uses, your yakal in the Lord, for there is faithful love with the Lord, and with him is redemption and abundance. Amen. So, yes, of course, we can hope in a way that focuses on our external circumstances. Out of this longing that things might get better, yes, we can do that, 100%. But hope in its fullest and most authentic expression is a hope in capital L-O-R-D, Yahweh. So Denison Baptist Church, hope has a name. His name is Jesus. And the Apostle Peter in many ways echoes the psalmist's words towards Yahweh with these words in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 3 to 4. Let's just have a, have a look at these two <coughs> verses from Peter. 1 Peter 1 verse 3 to 4. <coughs> Blessed be the God and Father, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given his new birth into a, a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. This Greek word for hope in the New Testament, elpis, it conveys so much of these other definitions of hope in the Old Testament. And look at how Peter in the same way expresses just this ultimate hope that he has in his heart. He's not thinking about his circumstances. His whole focus is on the person of Christ. So... I hope, I hope we see this morning the difference between this general, worldly, circumstantial hope that so many people have and even so many Christians have today and the hope that you and I have in Jesus. I hope not just to save us, but I hope to sanctify us, to make us more and more like him. So our hope in Christ is in what he has done for us, this reality that we have relationship with him, but it's also a hope that he's making us more and more like Christ day after day. He redeems us and he also sanctifies us. James says in chapter 4 and verse 8 of his letter, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. What is this but a hopeful expectation in the person and in the work of Jesus so that we ever increasingly become the people that God has created us to be? Uh, let's say, for example, you know and love someone uh, and they take seriously unwell. You feel compelled in your heart to pray for them, to intercede for them. As believers of the way, as followers of Christ, your hope is not in the possibility that they might get better. That's not what we hope in. Your hope is in the one who can make them better. You look to the one who can do all things, knowing that no matter what happens, they're in God's hands. God loves them. God cares for them more than we could ever love and care for them. No matter what we face, therefore, Jesus has to be the personification of hope. He has to be our hope. We see these situations and circumstances of our lives, but we look to the one who can change these circumstances. We don't look to the circumstances believing and hoping that they will change. It is only God who can change what we see around us. And this helps us as we come to terms with the fact that our world, our society, our very lives are marked by darkness, which is our focus this morning. And John touches upon this in verse 5 of our passage. And he speaks of a particular light. He says this, that light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. That light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. Now, we can say this morning there is hope because... The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Uh, and these lights, sorry, one of the most uh, obvious indicators that Christmas is upon us is through, through what? Through the presence of lights. We see lights everywhere. We have them here today. Lights in the tree, lights around windows, lights in the garden, lights in the house. There are lights everywhere. It's all pervasive. And these lights have a practical function. We put these lights up during the darkest time of the year. So they have this practical dimension to them. These lights also have 
an aesthetic purpose. They look nice. James loves walking around our estate and looking at all the different lights. And also the giant snowman, but it has no theological significance. So. <laughs> uh, these lights, whether we know it or not, carry theological significance. The lights carry theological significance. Our world is a dark place, and we will never get through life in this dark place unless Jesus becomes our light, capital L-I-G-H-T. That light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. And I can't help it but be drawn to the words of Isaiah 9 and verse 2. The prophet Isaiah says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. So what does John mean? What does Isaiah the prophet speak of here? When they highlight this notion of darkness. Spiritual darkness at its heart is to live a life separate from God. Complete separation from God. And our sin is what separates us from God. It's a declaration of war from us to God when we sin. We believe that God is not enough. That life can be found outside of relationship with him. We reject God's love and his provision for us. And because this is so serious and so significant to our lives, sin is more than just what we do. Sin is who we are. We are by definition sinners. So to be in spiritual darkness... It's not just about being separate from God. It's living a life that is completely contrary to God. The fruit of our separation is endemic sinfulness. And that's bad news. That's a, that's a difficult reality for us to take. Have a look at what the Apostle John says about this. In 1 John 1, verses 5 to 6, John highlights how as we can know whether or not we are still living in darkness by the life that we live. So John says this, this is a message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light and there is absolutely no darkness in him. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and not practicing the truth. If we say we have fellowship with him and we consciously choose to walk in darkness, we're lying to ourselves. We're kidding ourselves on. We're lying to other people. So darkness is everywhere. We know this. We see this on our news. Darkness is all pervasive and it's a fresh reminder that we are both separate from God but we're also sinful towards him. We choose to reject him day after day. And so the lights that you put up at Christmas are another reminder for us. Our lights highlight that you and I need Jesus because we actually consist of some of that darkness. And I just find it fascinating. We have non-believers who put lights up on the tree, lights up on their house and they're making a really important theological statement when they do that. And oftentimes, they have no idea. They're completely clueless to what this means. But light represents the fact that we need Jesus because we are in darkness. In fact, we are a part of that darkness. In both our verse in John, the words of Isaiah the prophet, we read something interesting, something that both authors recognized. The light comes from the outside. And it goes towards the inside. The light doesn't come from within the darkness itself. So John says, that light shines into the darkness. Isaiah says, a light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. So the light didn't come from the land. The light came from outside and shone onto the land of darkness. And our society thinks that the answer to the problem of darkness comes from inside, from in here. Our society will say, if only we had good education, if only we had political parties and politicians with integrity, if only we were more altruistic and loving towards one another, if only, if only, if only. All of these different solutions and none of them work. None of them make sense. The answer is not and never will be in here. Never. The opposite, the problem is in here. The very fact that we have to have an answer in the first place is rooted in the problem that exists in the human heart. Have a look at what Tim Keller says on this subject. He says, the promises of Christmas cannot be discerned unless you first admit you can't save yourself or even know yourself without the light of his unmerited grace in your life. This is the foundational truth from which we can proceed to learn the hidden meanings of Christmas. You can't save yourself. 
That's the message of Christmas. We need external light. We need Jesus to come and to rescue us. The answer has to come from outside. And when it comes from the outside in, then we can say there is hope. We can say that with confidence. There is hope. Brothers and sisters, Denison Baptist Church, our hope is a person. His name is Jesus. Jesus himself said this. So it's, it's clear. Jesus himself said this. He said, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never, not per, quite possibly not, Jesus says, will never walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. What an encouragement for you and for me this Christmas. The question I want to close with, based on our passage in John's Gospel, what does it mean for Jesus to be our light in the darkness this Christmas? What does that actually mean? How does that affect our lives during this Christmas season and beyond this Christmas season as we think about 2023? I think, first of all, to have light means that you and I can have confidence. We can have confidence this Christmas. Uh, have a look at what John says in verses 1 to 5 of our passage. John says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him, and apart from him not one thing was created that has been created. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. Now, what does that tell you and I about Jesus? As we look at these words from verse 1 through to verse 5, what do we learn about Christ from these words, from this passage? What well, tells us that Jesus is God, no doubt about it. He is God, and that as God, he is all-powerful. That's the first thing. It tells us that Jesus is God, and that as God, he existed in the very beginning. Before creation was established, Jesus existed, fully God. It tells us that Jesus is God, and that as God, he made you and I. God knows us better than we know ourselves. No question about that. And it tells us that Jesus is God, and that as God, he made us for a purpose. God has given each one of us a particular purpose. Our purpose being one where we have life. We experience his life and we then reflect God's goodness to those around us. So as we live out his purpose for our lives, we start to shine as lights to those who are still in darkness. So we can have confidence. We can have absolute confidence this morning that despite the darkness around us at Christmas, despite the darkness that can so often pervade our lives beyond Christmas, God through his son Jesus is making us new. He's making us new and he will one day make all things new. This is his plan for each one of us. And none of what we ever do at Christmas will ever make sense. None of it will ever make sense until we come to this reality that God loves us and he wants to change us. So we can have confidence that God has the very best for us during this Christmas season. Secondly, what it means for Jesus to be our light in the darkness is that you and I can also have assurance. We can have assurance. And have a look again at what John writes in verses 10 to 13. We read these words about Christ. John says, He was in the world, and the world was created through him, and yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of natural descent, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. Now these words that we find in John's Gospel are words that are unlike any other words that you might find in any other religious text. There are no words like this in any other faith system around the world or throughout history. When we receive Christ, when we believe in his name, we become, this is the best gift we can receive at Christmas, we become children of God. We become children of God. To be a child of God in John's day and in our day, this means something. 
It means something. You cannot escape it, particularly at Christmas. God came to this earth to be born as one of us, to live amongst us, to die the death that we deserve to die, to give us new life so that we might then become children of God. And so if God is our heavenly father and we are his beloved children, then without question, this relationship can never be removed from our lives. We can never lose this living and loving relationship with God. That's assurance. That's assurance. To know this bond that we have with God because he has changed us. To know that that exists means that we can never lose it. We can never lose it. What a gift. What a gift at Christmas. The Apostle Paul says this to the church in Rome. Romans 8, 38 to 39. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, there's plenty of superlatives there. Nothing, nothing can separate you from the love of God because you are his child. He is your heavenly father. Drink that in. Drink that in this morning. God loves us. He cares for us. And we can never lose this relationship with him if we have this relationship with him. So confidence, number two, assurance. And finally, what it means for Jesus to be our light in the darkness is that you and I are also able to experience his presence. So have a look at verse 14 through to verse 18. John says this, The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, we observed his glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him and exclaimed, This is the one of whom I said, The one coming after me ranks ahead of me, because he existed before me. Indeed, we have all received grace upon grace from his fullness. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the, only, the one and only Son, who is himself God and is at the Father's side. He has revealed him. So John says here that God himself, Jesus, became flesh. He dwelt amongst us. And that because of his presence on this earth, we have now received grace upon grace upon grace from his fullness. John is speaking about this objective reality of what Christ has done. But notice that he's also highlighting the subjective experience of being a follower of Jesus. We find it easy to focus on what God has done for us objectively. So much harder to, to speak of, of the experience of Christ within our lives. The way in which he gives us peace and hope. The way in which we experience his love in ways that we cannot describe. As we looked at already from, Jane, from James, we can know and experience the nearness of God in our lives. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. The Old Testament would describe this as his presence, his presence. Some translations would describe this as a face of God upon our lives. You know, we often experience so much when we see someone face to face. This is why Zoom is so problematic because we don't actually see them. We see the person's face on a screen. But when you see someone face to face, it just changes things in a way that wouldn't exist we didn't have it we experience so much of God in our lives when we are open to his presence and we ask for his nearness and it's very much what John says here in verse 16 grace upon grace from his fullness we know this to be true in Sundays is it not the case that we experience his presence as we sing together without question as we sang this morning as Samuel led us in that time of worship, I could experience the presence of God in our midst. When we open up our hearts to his word, when we take time to pray together as a, as a church family, we know his nearness and his presence as we do that together and as the spirit is at work. On Wednesday, we had a half hour of prayer together at 12.30 and there was about six or seven of us for a short time and it was without question, it was a powerful time. God met with us through his word. We were edified through our prayers for one another. 
And we were expectant of what it is that God might do within this Advent season. So in all of these ways, through song, through time in the Word, what we're doing right now, through times of prayer together, we experience God's nearness. We experience His presence. We know in a much deeper way the face of God. Presence is so important. You know, think about someone you haven't seen in a long time and then you see them again. How blessed you are when you see them and you're encouraged by them and how blessed we are when we become aware of God's sanctifying presence in our midst through the gift of his Holy Spirit. And I'm not speaking about some kind of weird mystical force. I'm speaking about the person of God, his Holy Spirit at work amongst us in our hearts and in our minds to change and direct our wills. So presence, without question, as we gather together and as God is at work in our midst, it's an absolute gift. And again, it highlights something of this light shining in the darkness. So this Christmas, let's be honest, you may find that this is a time of difficulty for you. Let's recognise that. Christmas can be hard for us. Perhaps you find this to be a time, a season where there's, there's more sin within your life. It may be a time when you experience uh, sufferings of various kinds. Uh, perhaps it's a time when, when you had certain expectations of certain individuals and those expectations were not met. Quite possibly this is a difficult time because you're reminded of Christmas's past and some difficult moments and experiences that you've had. Let me invite you this morning to take hold of these words from John. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. And when this truth becomes everything of who we are, we can say with confidence, there is hope. There is hope. And we can see that the person of Jesus in our lives, he will bless us with confidence. He will grant us assurance. And we will come to experience his presence. Confidence, assurance and presence. So as we close this morning, we just want to create some space uh, for you to respond to all that we've looked at together. Uh, this may be a moment where you give your life to the Lord. We recognise that as we have, have shared all of us, as we have sang and spent time in the Word, maybe you have never made that decision to put Christ first. Let me encourage you to, to respond to him in faith. And if you want to understand more of what that means, then do speak to myself or to someone you know who knows the Lord. Uh, this may be a time where you need prayer. In light of all that we've spent time looking at, maybe you need prayer for something. Maybe it's prayer for healing. Maybe it's prayer for a situation that you're facing. Again, this is a, a safe space. This is a loving family who want to pray for you in the midst of what it is you're facing. So do speak with us and we would count it a privilege to pray for you and ask that God by his grace would strengthen you. It may even be prayer for someone else in your life. Maybe for someone you know and love. Or maybe it's someone you, you know vaguely. Maybe it's someone who you've came across in your life, who needs prayer, who needs intercession. Again, do speak with us and we can take some time to do that. Uh, this morning we also uh, come to this table. So as we respond in song, we thank God that he is our light. And because he is our light, this is not just a table of remembrance and reflection. This is also a table of joy. It's a table of giving thanks. It's a table of rejoicing. Because Jesus has shone into our lives, we can then give him thanks for all that he has done for us through his death on the cross. <coughs> his body was given to us. His blood was shed for us. This means that our sins have been cast into the sea of forgetfulness and we are free from this pool of the world, the flesh and the devil. So if you love Jesus today, as we sing together, we invite you to come to the table and to take this bread, to drink this cup, and to recognise just how good and gracious God has been to each one of us. The bread represents Christ's body. The cup represents his blood. We take, we eat. We take, we drink. We give thanks. We say thank you, Jesus, that you are our light. And because of that, there is hope. It was on the night in which he was betrayed that Jesus took the bread <coughs> and he broke it. <coughs> And he said, this is my body, which is for you. And in the same way, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink this, 
do so in remembrance of me. As often as we take this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. So there's also expectation. We take this bread, we drink this cup, and we ought to be excited in our hearts for the fact that this light is going to get brighter and brighter and brighter until that day when we see him face to face. And what a day that will be. What a day. Let's pray together as a church family as we reflect on all of this. Father, we, we thank you that we have been able to, to just take stock of what your word says. And Lord, I pray that, that as we have understood, I pray that we would then apply, that, that we would uh, come to terms with the fact that, that we have this hope and you are our light and we would choose to live now as children of God, as children of light. Would you wash us clean of all sin and would you help us to be the individuals that you've called us to be? through our work of your Holy Spirit. We ask that you bless us now as we respond in these various ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys.